I'd like to start with introducing Margie. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to the CIR talk series. Uh, my name is Hamad Zamani. I am a faculty at the Center for Intelligent Information Retrieval uh, at UMass Amherst. And it's my pleasure to host Professor Marty Hurst here with us today. Um, Marty is a professor at the University of California, Berkeley in the School of Information and the Computer Science Division. Um, she's a pioneer and the leader in search engine interfaces, so it's uh, really exciting to have her here with us today. Um, her research encompasses user interfaces with a focus on search, information visualization, with a focus on text, computational linguistics, and educational technology. Um, she is the author of uh, search user interfaces, which is the kind of a kind of a bible for uh, kind of search interfaces uh, in this area. It was the first book in this topic. She co-founded the ACM Learning and Scale Conference, and is a former president of ACL, a member of the Chi Academy, and the Sigar Academy, an ACM fellow, and has received four excellence in teaching awards uh, from the students at UC Berkeley. She received her PhD, master's and bachelor's degrees in computer science from UC Berkeley and was a member of the research staff at the York Splunk. So today, Marta will talk about integrating NLP into information-centric user interfaces. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming Marty to Amherst, snowy Amherst, virtually. Thank you so much for having me. Please let me know if my audio isn't good or if there's any problems like that. Uh, great. And Jeremy, it was uh, cool seeing you on your exercise machine while you're listening. I think that's a great way to parallel process. And I see some other friends like Moit and so on. Yeah, way to go. <laughs> Don't fall. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's really great to be here and it's great to not have to fly. This is like the right way to, to uh, do visits, I think. And I have a lot of material, so you know if I'm if it's going too long, just stop me. Uh, and if it's not making sense, just feel free to ask questions. I'll try to articulate. I, I do have a fair amount of material today, so hopefully it's of interest to you. So what I will talk about today is the intersection of HCI and NLP and how it aligns with information-centric tasks like search and related tasks. And I find that often people that work in NLP or information retrieval don't know a lot about the HCI process. And since I think there might be some students here today too, I wanted to give a brief introduction to HCI. Okay, good, how about nodding. So this is part of a keynote talk that I gave to the NLP HCI workshop at KDD, I think, or something like that. So what does the combination of HCI plus NLP mean? Well, it's I think of it as using NLP to help people within user interfaces and using HCI techniques to improve NLP. So I look at it from both sides of these and, and this will become a little clearer what I mean as I go. Our talk outline is I'll very briefly describe the user-centered design process, but I won't take too long about on that for those of you who know it. And then I'm gonna center the rest of it around three demos of recent work in my lab. And with, after each demo or, or within a discussion of each of these demos, I'm gonna talk about lessons of on HCI and NLP. And hopefully that will be interesting. So the user-centered design process is an iterative process. And this consists of talking to people, which is called user research, doing design, prototyping and evaluating, and it's iterative. Uh, you keep doing that and then eventually you build something and you, you, you do it again. So the idea is it's not right the first time. You have to refine over and over, get close. It's a very big design space. You land in a local optima and then you refine to get into a more global optima. It's one way to think about it uh, when we do design. User research consists of understanding who the potential users are, what their goals are, what tasks they need to perform with the system you're designing. And task analysis involves characterizing what steps users need to take to achieve their goals, create scenarios of actual use that you can then exercise your tool on and decide which users and tasks to support because usually there are far too many to, to support in one interface without it becoming too unwieldy. So this is a picture of a prototype. Uh, so we build paper prototypes first. We don't just go straight to code when we do user interface design. 
And the reason we prototype is so that we can experiment with multiple alternative designs to really work through that design space, fix problems before code is written, because it's much easier to fix a user interface design on paper or in a little prototyping tool before we write code and keep the design centered on the user rather than on the implementer or the designer. And then to evaluate user interfaces, we can use different kinds of techniques. There are some called discount usability evaluation techniques where we pilot test prototypes. So we have these paper prototypes are very simple, not really interactive prototypes. And we just run them by prospective users and see what's right and wrong about them. And we do that over and over again until the design is in a good place. And then, uh, and then we can also do expert evaluations on prototypes, which are actually quite effective before we write a line of code. And then once it, the design, we're pretty confident it's in a good part of the design space after iterating on the discount techniques, then we can do evaluations with real participants uh, which are often very task and interface specific and really then try to do statistical significance testing. But these require a lot of care, thought and iteration as well. You don't just make up a task and then put it in front of a lot of people. You actually have to pilot test your design of your study too. So I'd like to do a contrast between the typical HCI process versus the typical NLP or maybe partly information retrieval process where in HCI, as I said, we identify the user need, we develop methods to address the user need, and then we evaluate the methods on user need. Whereas in NLP, and I think often in IR, we identify an NLP problem, we develop an algorithm, and then we evaluate the algorithm on accuracy and speed. You know, and we, of course, we downstream think the NLP algorithm is gonna help with some user task. And with IR, of course, we, we know we're doing ranking and the ranking order is important for users but it's still somewhat removed from users a lot of the time. And these each have their strengths. I mean, you don't wanna just make an NLP algorithm and put it in front of a user because if it's really poor, <laughs> it's just a waste of time. So you do wanna evaluate on test sets and so on and get it into good shape before you put it in front of a user. And there's downsides to the HCI method too, uh, which I'll talk about. And a big one of those is lack of reproducibility. So, all right, so here's the first demo in the first system, and this is called Scholarfy. And this was a big, is a big collaborative project between my lab and Allen Institute for AI, AI2, and people at University of Washington and supported by the Sloan Foundation. Oh, it already appeared. So the motivation for this project is, you know, if you have you ever struggled to keep track of notation or acronyms when reading a scientific paper, so for example, if you see this on a paper, in a paper, like what do these things mean? What is the chi? What is Y uh, to the role of FT and so on? You know, what do these stand for? Do you ever forget that when you're reading a paper? Uh, I know I do. <laughs> or if you're looking at the results section of a paper, you know, what is that D and M? And what is gold? What is Lisa? What is SA? Would it be nice to have something help remind you what these acronyms stand for? So here's what we thought it was a problem. And so here, oh boy, I have to tell me if the audio plays uh, when I start this, okay. In this talk, I introduce ScholarFi, an augmented reading interface that helps people read scientific papers by revealing definitions of technical terms and symbols right where readers most need them. The interface has extremely strong usability results, reducing the effort needed to answer questions about a paper. In a lab study, all participants reported they would use its core features frequently in future reading tools. The design of ScholarFi is motivated by the fact that, despite the importance of papers to scientific progress, they can be difficult to read. Comprehension is often hindered when the information a reader needs to understand a passage resides somewhere else, in another section or another paper. One problem is the abundance of abbreviations, mathematical symbols, and new terms defined within a paper for use only within that paper. These are called nonce words. Unlike standard scientific terminology, which an expert in the field is expected to learn and memorize, nonce words are like temporary variables in a programming language. They are defined for use only in the paper and can impose a memory burden for the reader to learn. They are often cryptic, it can be hard to infer a nonce word's meaning from context. 
and a paper can contain hundreds of them densely packed together. How can interfaces show definitions of nonce words to readers when and where they need them the most? We designed ScholarFi, an augmented reading interface that surfaces just in time position sensitive definitions of nonce words, given a set of definitions that has been extracted from the text. At its most basic, ScholarPy provides standard interactive hypertext affordances. Interactive terms are shown with subtle underlines to convey their interactivity without distracting from reading. Terms can be clicked to open compact tooltips containing definitions. Atop this basic interactivity, ScholarPy provides five unique interface components to augment the reading experience. First, it improves on standard affordances for selecting terms to better accommodate definitions of mathematical notation. Any symbol can be selected by just clicking on it. Any sub-symbol can be selected by clicking again. Second, it shows compact definitions of terms in tooltips. These definitions are position sensitive. That is, if the term has been defined differently in multiple passages, the most recent definition of that term is shown. Links accompany the definition, which take a reader to the definitions in context. And if a reader wants more information about the term, they can open a sidebar of all definitions defining formulas or usages of the term. The third innovation is called declutter. When a reader selects a term, ScholarPy eliminates visual clutter to help readers scan the paper for usages. It does this by highlighting segments of text that contain matches and fading out the unmatched sentences. The fourth innovation is equation diagrams. When the reader selects a display equation, ScholarPy diagrams the equation, showing the definitions for all symbols at once, where labels are automatically affixed to each symbol and subsymbol in the equation. The final innovation is an automatically generated glossary of unique terms and symbols prepended to the start of the paper. This priming glossary can help prepare the reader for nonce words that appear in the paper. With these features, ScholarPy makes it easy for readers to find out what a nonce word means without getting in their way. In a usability study, 27 researchers used ScholarPy to read a scientific paper. When asked to answer questions about the paper with either a standard PDF reader or ScholarPy, researchers answered questions correctly with both tools. When using ScholarPy, they answered questions in significantly less time and found answers by looking at significantly less of the paper. They found it easier to answer the questions and were more confident in their answers. During unstructured reading time, researchers used all of the features of ScholarPy to support their reading activity. Researchers reported they could see themselves using tooltips and equation diagrams often or always if integrated into their reading interfaces. Read our paper to learn about formative user research that motive. Okay, so hopefully that gives you the idea of what is behind the ScholarPy project. Uh, so now um, in this talk, I'm going to have a format for HCI plus NLP tips and elaborations. So here's one of the tips from the ScholarFi work, which is that usable interfaces require multiple rounds of pilot testing and refinement. This project was really the result of many years of work. Uh, we had four rounds of piloting, uh, again, over a long period of time. In this case, the core idea of bringing the symbols and equations to life and, and definitions for them to life was always positively responded to, but the details of how to implement it, that in the interface were very difficult to get right because it's very, pretty much anything you do on a PDF is gonna get in people's way because reading is very cognitively task and task, reading a complex scientific document even more so. So we refined this for months and got continual feedback from relevant users. And of course, studied the relevant HCI literature and took that into account until we got an interface that people felt what really, really worked for them. And that's, it's not easy to do that. Small details really matter for information-centric user interfaces. We need logical organization of information, visible cues for current and next choices, interactions that sustain people's flow, don't get in the way, don't cause friction, legible text without artifacts and following standards that people expect. And these are all standard usability recommendations, but it's very hard to have them all hold in the design of one interface and still do whatever it is you're trying to do. But, and if you don't use these techniques, these are some quotes from some other work of what happens. Uh, this is a quote from ground.ai. 
In a live system, presentational details become disproportionately important. In our initial deployment, rendered text contained artifacts of the underlying tokenization. These were no doubt relatively trivial matters of software engineering, but in initial informal evaluations, users kept mentioning these imperfections over and over again, distracting them from considering the underlying quality of the system. And I see this sort of thing all the time that in, in you know, we, we have something that we've developed, we want to put it in front of users and we didn't pay attention to the details and that's all the users see. And that's the recipe for failure for your study. And then people feel like they don't want to do studies because they don't get people, people don't pay attention to what they care about. But if you know going in what you have to do to make the participants focus on what you're interested in, then you won't have that problem. And again, I'm open to any questions that people have. Another lesson from Scholarfy, which it wasn't surprising, we knew this was going to be the case, but is that real applications shed light on tough, underexplored NLP problems. So definition recognition has uh, been around a long time, but it's far from solved and it's really underexplored. It's not an area that gets a lot of excitement in NLP, uh, and, but it's really hard to do accurately. It's really hard to define definition and it's really hard to get it up to 99% accuracy, which is really what we need for this application. And uh, you know, high precision and high recall, super, super hard. Easy to get 75, hard to get 95. And so here's some examples. We wanna do a document level definition detection. So from a, a given scholarly document, we wanna recognize things like symbol nickname detection, like the hyperparameter alpha, so alpha is called hyperparameter. That one's, this example is relatively easy. We also need term definition, like textual attainment is the task of blah, 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 but it's very hard to determine the boundaries of the definition and what's a good definition. And here's a acronym expansion, which it's pretty easy to get decent results on this somewhat, you know, like I said, even up to 90%, but that last 10% is really hard. And then even more interesting are the multi-term and complicated coordination patterns we see in scientific texts that we don't see in standard newswire and so on. So look at this. We represent the projected box B sub P to the L as a four-dimensional vector with a bunch of math where D to T to the one, D to T to, it's sort of hard to read this, D L to the one, B to the one, et cetera are the distances between the current pixel location ij and the top, bottom, left, and right boundaries of b sub p to the l, respectively. So we actually want to match these symbols with these terms. So we have really complex coordination, which is very rarely studied in the NLP literature. OK, and I see you have a question. How, how, how would we find out what exact users find hard when they're reading a paper and decide what kind of information you should include? Uh, so that's done with uh, interviewing people. And we also will have people read papers, take notes while they're doing it, and then interview them afterwards to ask them what was easy and what was hard for them. And and um, then decide what kind of information. And that we you know we're not, and we don't plan to solve the entire problem with one design, uh, but we, did, we were interested in this particular problem of the mathematical notation and and, and understanding terms that are not already defined. And we saw that as a particular aspect that we thought automation right in place could most easily make a difference for versus not having the fundamentals of the math, which would be much harder to try to solve in a reader tool. Did I answer your question, Eamon? Maybe we maybe can off, off mic. Uh, yes, okay. And the next question, what do the findings apply for how authoring systems could be enhanced to provide information for the scholar of five? That's a great question. And I think that actually uh, what our work shows is that Overly for Sherla, well, it used to be Sherla Tech, should incorporate checks while you're writing to, in effect, that falls right out of what we're doing here to show a lot of errors. Like you haven't defined the symbol. This is in, uh, consistently defined. I don't know about you, but when we're writing a paper, we start naming something one way and then we change the name and it's inconsistent all over the place. And I'm always having to tell the students to clean it all up. Uh, but something that recognized that would be super helpful. And I think all of those things are pretty doable. And we've done some follow-up work on trying to automatically guess 
uh, like for some math notation, what the variable names might be based on priorly named variables based on standards and related papers. But yeah, I think that that would be a really great project that you know, when we've talked about, like the people have worked on this, we've talked about trying to do follow on work for integration into Overleaf. Hopefully I answered that. But I think they're very tightly related rather than having a checker that goes over your paper and says, your paper is unclear, which is a lot of them are, it'd be better to go over your draft and says, uh, clean up your draft. <laughs> yeah. So we did develop a definition extraction algorithm that did get state-of-the-art results. That's partly because the state-of-the-art you know, wasn't very sophisticated at the time. So we added some standard uh, deep learning stuff on top of using a CRF and then we added some heuristic rules and we did an in-depth error analysis. And we we actually found that uh, we needed to have a more sophisticated technique to really get the accuracy higher. And that work is uh, still in, in progress to actually push that out. But we have developed some techniques that are, that are a bit more accurate, but it's a really hard problem and not enough people are working on it. And it's really hard to make the test sets for it. Yeah, when you have, stuff like this. Like when you say the scalar parameter, why do the task allows the task model to scale the entire vector? You know, is that a definition or is that an elaboration? A lot of these things are really hard. All right, so I'm gonna leave Scholarfy and go to the next topic now. This is our words, unless there's other, are there other questions on Scholarfy? Go back. Um, sorry, I have a question. Uh, so this is actually going off of what you responded to Amen's question. Um, so, so you said that you determined how it was hard was found by doing interviews with people. Uh, I'm wondering what was it that led you to pick this problem of like enhancing readability, which is sort of the larger problem rather than like the bigger space of all problems that people have with papers. Oh, that's a great question. My, um, well, He's, he was then my postdoc, but previously my PhD student, Andrew Head and I had done an earlier project and his dissertation was a line of work on providing explanations for code. And uh, we had this project called Tutorons where we gave explanations for if you have say a blog describing how to implement something and it just happens to mention like WGET, but doesn't explain it. Then we were bringing up examples for WGET and some code slices that we were automatically generating. And I just thought that was a really cool project. And he didn't focus on that for his dissertation. And I always thought it was great. And I just thought it would be neat to expand on that. And then I also just personally have a lot of trouble remembering the names of the symbol, what the meanings of the symbols are. And I thought the two together would really help with broadening AI. A lot of people are talking about explainable AI. And I thought, why don't we really explain AI? <laughs> and so it's, it was kind of a combination of a lot of things that we'd been thinking about for a long time, which led us there. Awesome, thanks so much. Another question? Great. All right. And this, is a, this next project is something that I've also thought about for a long time. So as way of background, for many years, I taught one semester, I would teach natural language processing, and the next semester, I would teach information visualization. And these fields, the people in them don't interact very much. There's very few people that are in both. One is about language and one is about images. And I was constantly thinking, I constantly think about how are these similar or different from each other? What can you express with language that you can't express with visuals and vice versa? And oh dear, <laughs> let me turn that off. Right. And so um, this work comes out of that and my, uh, well, and my frustration with word clouds. So this is a way to improve word clouds. And I did some prior work on word clouds like a decade ago as well. And this is a big group of us at Berkeley uh, with uh, some people at Northwestern. So word clouds, here's a word cloud. They are engaging and popular. And they were originally intended for fun. And there's nothing wrong with that. But today, word clouds are frequently misused or used or misused in journalism, in scientific communication. And to me, that is a problem. 
And it's partly because there's no alternative, but that doesn't really excuse it because <laughs> they don't convey, convey the intended message. So this is a word cloud from 2016. And it was about Obama's, it was from Obama's State of the Union address. But then what the journalists wrote about this was Obama set out an agenda turning back the effects of climate change, launching a moonshot to cure cancer, and a grassroots movement to demand changes in the political system. But the things I've highlighted in orange don't appear in this word cloud. So the, the word cloud wasn't really conveying anything. And, and you had really had to read the article to see what anything interesting from the State of the Union address. Because yeah, I know it was about America and the economy, you know, is it really helping me to see this thing? And I can ask you quickly, maybe type in the chat, get ready to type in the chat as fast as you can. What is this a summary of? Okay. No one types. All right, well, I'm gonna tell you the answer. It's Hamlet's soliloquy. <laughs> I don't think it was very obvious, was it? And, you know, here, that's why, why is it? It's the text is just totally different from what you see there. And this is, this is what you always get when you do a word cloud on a Hamlet's soliloquy. It's, it looks like it's about animals hibernating or something, right? Uh, it's just, it's not good for getting the gist of something. Now, what's this about? Well, it's intended as an advertisement for a course. So I don't know, does this make you want to take this class? Uh, so my hypothesis is that standard word clouds are detrimental to understanding. And a list of words is better for summarizing a text. On the other hand, they're engaging. So perhaps organizing the words both semantically and visually will improve understanding while retaining engagement. But unfortunately, a lot of the automatic semantic groupings are not really, don't make sense to people either. And I have a long history of talking about that problem. But I want to just prove this hypothesis that organizing words in a word cloud this way will make them more understandable and still keep them engaging. How do we beat word clouds at its own game? That's what I wanted to study. So can we fix this supposedly informational word cloud? Well, here's a little demonstration of how. So these are pretty much the same words, but organized differently. Yeah, COVID vaccines, <laughs> camping. <laughs> yeah, so pretty hard. So that this is a subset of those words. And I, I think you would probably agree with me that it's a little bit easier to see what's going on and it's still engaging in the appearance. So how do we test this hypothesis? So there are problems with a lot of the prior evaluations of word clouds. There's no shared data sets, no reproducibility. And I read a lot of word cloud papers. Often there's no human evaluation at all where people just make a new layout and claim it's great. Uh, there are often unfair baselines or only one baseline. And the tasks don't often match the underlying goals. Like the task is find the biggest word. But if you just want to find the biggest word, why don't you just show a picture with one big word, you know, and don't show the other words. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. So what we did in this work is we came up with a new evaluation method. And the goal of this is to determine how well a layout you know, summarizes the main topics of a document while retaining engagement. And the goal was also to make a reproducible evaluation in HCI and have it reflect a task that word clouds are supposed to do. Because people often say they give you the gist or they summarize some document. And if that's the case, then you know, how do you measure that? And I will say uh, this, this evaluation took nine months to come up with. I mean, not nine months constantly not working on anything else, but nine months of thinking about it off and on. It was not easy because just um, how do you meet all these goals? But eventually we came up with the idea of taboo words. And this is based on the game of taboo, sort of. So what we do is we, we built up a set of words that unambiguously indicate a category without naming the category. And these are supposed to simulate the underlying topics of a document. And then we want to see how long it takes someone to guess the underlying category names when the words are around, arranged in a word cloud. So here's an example. Here's a list of words. What's the underlying, what's the underlying uh, concept? Anyone? 
Okay, I'm seeing, I lost my mouse so I can't get to the chat, there it is. Restaurant, excellent. So we made, really I, made a bunch of these stimuli and very, very, very carefully crafted all five words such that native English speakers unambiguously said the same word or the same couple of words. And they <clears throat> verified this a Mechanical Turk where we get 95% agreement if people saying the same word or higher in isolation. So this required many rounds of iteration to get the stimuli right. So something I'm trying to emphasize is when you do a usability study, you know, it's not the first thing that you think of. Here's an example of the stimuli. And if you kind of look at it, you can see eventually, now we've color coded this that hopefully you see the blue corresponds to cow and the green to college or university are the two acceptable words. And then we made groups of five of these sets of stimuli and we made a bunch of these, like 60 of these, and then we could mix and match them automatically into groups of five. And then we could do comparisons, say between this layout where we have columns with varying font sizes, or we have a blob. Uh, this is a Wordle style layout where color is still coding the category, uh, but there's no order to it. And then we had people at Mechanical Turk do a task of how many categories can you name within the time limit? And they can get a score from zero to five because there's five categories. Everyone got that? And so we can do things like, now we have the stimuli, we can do all kinds of variations like do mono color and say, okay, compare um, single font size in columns, varied font size in columns, single font size in the spatial and varied font size in the spatial. And then hypothesize, all right, I think this will be the best, second best, third best, fourth best, right? So you hold some aspects, aspects constant, compare others, make a hypothesis. And there you go. So we get statistically significant results, really strong, forever putting to bed the notion that word clouds are good in this sort of situation with a huge difference in the scores where the columns, both single and, and varied font were far, far better than the word cloud layout. The spot size variation was more complex uh, and then we also asked preference data and 93% preferred the column layout for the task and 83 for the aesthetics. And the aesthetics thing was surprising me. Overall, there's a bunch more results, but the key findings were that visually grouped layouts compared to ungrouped layouts are more effective in time constrained category understanding tasks. Visual grouping can be achieved by separating categories via blank space or color or both. And for analytical tasks, layouts with blank space tends to be preferred over spatially arranged groups. And, but the groups need to be semantically distinct. So if you don't do a good job of distinguishing the categories, it might not hold, we didn't test that. All right, so benefits of this evaluation approach. It's reproducible. We have published the categories, people can now use them. It allows for fair comparisons across many baselines and for randomization. It yields statistically significant results and it measures some of the underlying goals of the design. And then we also paired it with subjective evaluation so we can get to that as well. And we found that people preferred our layouts over standard Wordles, which surprised me actually. So that was also good. So we basically can categorically say we have a better design than standard word clouds. The one problem is we don't have a way to produce the semantic separation automatically. So that's still not really solved even in NLP. And so we get these nice results. So the takeaway, evaluate with realistic relevant tasks and it's realistic. And what I'm saying is the underlying goal was what is the gist or what is the summary of the document uh, and observe both subjective and quantitative results. Compare against a strong baseline, a full featured baseline. So we didn't compare against a poor version of Wordle. We compared against you know, what people like and the state of the art. And be sure the available contents are the same. So we had to write code to generate stuff. So everything was the same. And ideally vary as little between the two designs as possible, just test your hypothesis. And then we have a lesson for HCI from NLP, which is do reproducible studies, which is often pretty hard in HCI. 
All right, got a question here. I think the evaluation of word clouds should depend on what people will do with their understanding of a document. For example, if word clouds are shown as search result snippets, researchers could ask users about the relevance of the document. Yeah, that's interesting. I think people don't usually use word clouds for that purpose of relevance, um, mainly because snippets are just better. <laughs> but that I agree that if that was the task, that would be a good way to evaluate it potentially. But the thing that I, I've earlier done some work on, what do people say word clouds are for? <clears throat> and most of the time people say it's for summarizing or gisting a document or a set of documents. But I agree, it should align with the goals. I picked the goal in this case because it's the most commonly stated one. People also say they're good for seeing trends in data, which is just false, but no. Any other thoughts? Part of this was uh, my co-author, Steve Franconeri, who's an expert on visual design and perception. I was telling him at a conference just how I, terrible I thought word clouds were, and I thought he was just going to agree with me. Oh, yeah, they're awful. And he didn't. And I was like, I can't believe that you don't agree with me. Um, and so I'm like, I'm going to prove this to you. And he believes now. <laughs> so I was very motivated to have a very rigorous proof. So I think that's another way to think about studies is uh, imagine you're really trying to prove to somebody else who's very skeptical that this is true and in a scientific way rather than just, I have a cool system. Okay, all right. And speaking of that, here's my next uh, demo, our news chatbot. So this is uh, my student Philippe's baby, really. It's primarily his work and it's part of his news lens project and so his motivation was to provide an interface to news that would inspire deeper engagement. And he, had, he developed this really cool system. He had millions of, of documents of news over 10 years of data or more now. And the goal was to get people to engage in news and help journalists write stories. And the approach was to analyze millions of news articles, automatically detect stories, timelines, entities, and visualize these. And so the results initially were great. It, it, we have great NLP research in summarization, text simplification, entity recognition, headline grouping, and a highly valuable data set for NLP. The problem is the cool UI did not engage lay people or help journalists. <laughs> so we tried a lot of different things and it didn't work. So we had this really cool UI that shows, you know, the timeline. So he has his software, he could automatically determine in breaking news and in past news, what the main you know, events were, the main topics. And this all automated, automatically named too. North Korea nuclear test, Zika virus, Paris attacks, different things and make a cool timeline like this. And then it got even more sophisticated. He automatically would bring in information about entities from Wikidata and he would disambiguate even the not very common ones. And we tried this style of graph and what was very cool is we could go back in time to you know, many, many years to create the timeline fully automatically of what had happened. And this was super cool. And like we could zoom in on this one, we could get details about the actors, get quotes, all that. Okay, so, but the problem was nobody wanted to use these interfaces. <laughs> they were really cool, but they weren't solving anyone's problem. Because people who are already news junkies, they might kind of like it, or they would like it maybe, but there aren't that many people like that. And reporters don't need this because they're going and finding new news. So it wasn't solving anyone's problem, even though it looked really neat. And you know, that's just, that happens a lot and often within visualization and generally other things. So that didn't work. So we did a new, new approach, which was actually you know, what do people actually want to do when they, and how do people consume news? Uh, so our hypothesis was, you know, do something more like a chatbot. I mean, partly we didn't do a chatbot earlier because the technology wasn't there for the audio and it got better during the course of his dissertation. But, <clears throat> and then we thought, what if we could automatically have question asking and answering in the chatbot? Our hypothesis was that would increase engagement. And that's not something you can do, you could do, uh, at the time automatically. So 
I'm going to show a demo of our chatbot that lets you do this. But first, I'll, it goes kind of fast, so I'm going to step through it. So we made a, a demo that uh, would run on a, um, on a uh, mobile device. So news is automatically organized into stories. And we thought, OK, each story goes into a chat room. So about the British royal family, or an election, or impeachment inquiry, and the Boeing 737 Max story. That one's interesting because it goes back many years. And then a chat room starts with a timeline of events, and each one is composed of multiple sources. So this one is Reuters and The Guardian. And then there's questions you can ask. So questions are recommended to the reader, and they're updated as information is revealed. So if you ask a question about somebody, then the, another question follows up about that. And information is gathered both from news and Wikimedia, Wikipedia resources. And the reader can also ask their own questions. And an extractive Q&A system tries to find an, a likely answer. So I'll just show this demo now. In the chatbot, the news is organized into chat rooms. Let's look at the Boeing 737 story. Each room is initialized with a timeline. The user can click on recommended questions to navigate the story. For example, who replaced the CEO of Boeing? We use a Q&A model to answer the question. Okay, you kind of get the point, and then you can type in a question too. In the chat box. All right, all right. So we did a study with this, and when the chat bot recommends questions, newsreaders tend to have longer conversations with it than when it doesn't. Uh, so we saw that as a positive step. Uh, we have more recent work though, where uh, instead of a textual chat bot, which again was sort of an intermediate step, we have an audio podcast which gets automatically put together based on people can select a set of subjects. And then we have two voices have a conversation about the subject. Like, like, uh, you know, like on the news when you have two people you know, discussing two anchors right talking about the news. And then participants can ask questions with these stories. And we found that people prefer that two voices and the ability to ask questions over a podcast with news read straight through. So, and that's gonna be at IUI uh, 22. So we think this is really promising for a way to actually get people to engage in news. It's how people consume news often, but via audio and letting them engage and having multiple voices. So we think actually we finally hit on a formula that is promising. Uh, let's see, are there, okay. How are the recommended questions generated? I didn't say yet, but I'm going to say, so I'll get right there. So the takeaway here is that real applications can yield uh, highly valuable data sets for NLP research. So this news lens data set that Philippe collected has allowed us to do a lot of research on unsupervised summarization and simplification and headline grouping that we wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. Because <clears throat> he was really determined to, he just really came in wanting to build a real thing. And, but beware of cool versus usable. Because if you develop something that looks cool, it might not work as an interface for the intended users. It took us a long time to come up with, or to at least be able to do what we wanted, you know, what was starting to actually get good usability results. And the other thing is, you know, don't publish the thing if you're not getting good usability results, or don't or publish it as a negative result. Don't say, oh yeah, in the abstract, oh yes, it's results are promising when you know nobody wants the thing. Just be honest. Uh, so here's an example of putting cool before usable from uh, this is a uh, mastering Japanese through augmented browsing. After spending a lot of effort on the cool NLP problem, the feedback we received from our users was quite sobering. Apparently our users are a target audience with needs and preferences quite different from what computational linguists would prescribe. To summarize, the users opted for a more intuitive presentation style. So I really appreciate these people were honest in their reporting that what they wanted to do wasn't what people wanted to see. So what are the NLP methods behind the news lens tool that I showed? There's actually a bunch of stuff. <clears throat> so one thing we did was leverage question answering to keep track of the conversation state. So this is how do we suggest questions automatically 
that go with uh, a news story. So in dialogue, uh, one problem is the system might just sort of keep repeating the same thing over and over. So say the system says, since October in Australia, fires scorched more than 10 million hectares. And then maybe the user says, what else should I know? And then it says the fires, which have been raging since October, have killed 24 people and built 10 hectares. So you don't want it to repeat itself. And for a given story, there's a lot of different things you could say and a lot of different redundant content in the data. So what we do is we start with all of the paragraphs in a story, and these come from different sources, but there's a lot of repetition. And we use a, a standard question generator to generate many questions. So there's, there's a lot of these deep learning question generators. And we have it generate what, where, when, why questions. From each, each paragraph generates a bunch of questions. So now we have a lot of questions and a lot of paragraphs. Then we use a question answering system to see which paragraphs answer which questions. And we decide that two paragraphs are redundant if they cover the same questions. So we start with these and we see which questions can they answer of these questions. So can this answer this question? Can this answer that question? And we figure out uh, which paragraphs are redundant with each other. And as content is given to the user, we keep track of all of the answerable questions. So if we give them this paragraph, we know which questions we can answer as well. And then as content becomes redundant, all the questions and answers are already covered. So we can use this to recommend unanswered questions. So we've given these two paragraphs, we know which questions have been covered, and then we know which questions haven't been covered. And so this way, we're not gonna repeat ourselves. So this is generally how we generate the questions. So did I answer that question in the chat? Yeah, from Francisco. Yeah, okay. So that's how we do that. And I will say though, it's not perfect. You know, question generation, question answering still has a long way to go. A lot of the questions are kind of un uninteresting, but this field is rapidly improving. We also generate these summaries that you saw, we generate a lot of them. Sometimes we pull them from the news directly, but a lot of them are unsupervised summaries. And how am I on time, Hamid? Uh, you have about 10 minutes. Yeah. So I can, I can go through our um, NLP algorithms here, or I can wrap up. Uh, that's, that's kind of the choice, because that's all I have left. So what would people prefer? I think you can go through that, yeah. OK. I'll just talk, I'm going to briefly describe two NLP algorithms behind this work. One is an unsupervised, abstractive, summarization algorithm. And that it's unusual in that it's unsupervised and abstracted. So the goal is to generate summaries that don't require training examples, are highly abstractive, and we can control the length, and that cover the key content. So this is kind of relevant to information retrieval. So we have a novel reinforcement learning method that uses fill in the blank with motivated choices, and it balances coverage of the key content with fluency of the generated text. And it uses special techniques to fortify against degenerative cases that are very common with reinforcement learning algorithms. And at the time it had the best unsupervised results and it rival rivals supervised results at the time of the work. So what is abstractive summarization? If we have an article like this, what we wanna do is pull out some text and then, gen whoops, sorry, and then generate a fluent summary from these concepts. And so that, this is an example that our algorithm actually does. So that's the idea. And we wanna control automatically how long this is gonna be. So our good summary, our criteria that we feed to the reinforcement learning algorithm is we, a summary is brief, fluent text that covers the main points. And so these are the three criteria that our RL has to meet. <coughs> so, we start with uh, a target length, the original document, and a summarizer that's not very smart, and it just gener generates a summary. Then we have a masking procedure that generates a mass document, and that goes to the coverage module for the reinforcement learning. And this basically blanks out keywords. So then the coverage model has to, it's a fine-tuned vert, it has to recover these blanked words and figure out what they are. 
And this is how it learns what the important words are to include in the summary. If it figures these out, this means that the summary, if it can't figure them out, it means the summary doesn't have the right words in it. And if it does, it means the summary does have the right words in it. So that's the trick. So if it has a good coverage score, that means that the summary was good and it had a lot of key stuff in it. There's also a fluency score to make sure it reads well. And this is combined into one uh, summary score that's fed into the reinforcement learning algorithm, which we um, <clears throat> optimize, sorry, with a novel version of SCST. And so that's like in a nutshell, uh, this, this approach. There's other details. Uh, and then for simplifying, so that's what we do with summarization. We also have a way to simplify complex news, which builds on that reinforcement learning algorithm I showed you. So text simpl simplification is reducing the like, college level text to sixth grade level text, which is important to make news accessible. And these examples are from a hand generated corpus that's available for research. So we have a model called Keep It Simple where the generated text should be simpler than the original and it modifies the summary loop algorithm in an unsupervised way. And it has a novel way to compute similarity, the simplicity, which is to compute the grade level drop between the original and the generated text. And then uh, the words added, added to the generated text should be more common than words removed from the original text. And the results again were state of the art, outperforming even supervised methods. And we used a novel human evaluation to make sure the simplification worked. And this again, took a lot of thought. And what we decided to do was see if the people reading the simplified version could answer the same questions as people reading the original and reading the human simplified. So that was our new evaluation. So we had the original, the human generated, some competing algorithms in ours, and we generated four candidate simplification. These, uh, we generated some questions from the original. And the question is, could people answer them? So here's an original example with a high Lexile score. Each summer, libraries in St. Louis, Missouri host many types of free camps, yoga, chess, and even Harry Potter sorting hat camp. In 2020, camp dreams seem far-fetched given the global coronavirus pandemic. That didn't stop St. Louis libraries, though. And then this is our um, automatically generated uh, Lexile grade nine version. In the summer months, St. Louis has many free classes for kids, including yoga, chess, and a Harry Potter sorting hat camp. In 2020, camp dreams again seem far-fetched given the crisis. This didn't stop St. Louis libraries though. So it's, it's somewhat amazingly good. <laughs> um, so, all right, that's another example. So the standard approach to evaluate simplification are these automated blue scores and sorry scores and readability scores and doing these, having people use Likert scales to rate fluency, adequacy, and simplicity. But we did this human-centered approach uh, where we looked at, and, oh, and uh, we looked at how well people could answer questions. So this would be the original paragraph and our automatically generated paragraph. And these were the questions people had to answer about that thing I just read you, like who manages the St. Louis Library Kids Program? Were any camps in St. Louis canceled? How did the ukulele camp meet, et cetera? And we saw people answer these questions. So we also looked at how long it took. And with the original text, this is um, how many um, number of subs, what is that? I don't know, uh, must be how many they got right, I think. Oh no, that's something else. Um, this, is, this is the time and this is how many substitutions. Uh, oh gosh, I forget what that means. Uh, it means something interesting, but I forget. Anyway, uh, people were faster using our system and they were more accurate, but I think I lost the accuracy <laughs> scores here. Uh, they were more accurate using our system than the other automated systems, although the original text was, was the most accurate. Maybe that's what this is. All right, so in summary, uh, combining HCI and NLP, uh, there's a lot each area can learn from the other. We can use NLP to help people with interfaces and use HCI techniques to improve NLP. So how to come up with a successful novel user interface design. Be sure you've identified a real need, put the user needs ahead of technology coolness, pilot, 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 
Small details matter as much as large ideas. And to avoid evaluation errors, don't assess what makes one's own technology look good versus assessing what people need or understand. And don't measure what is easy to measure versus what matters. And to evaluate, to devise a good evaluation, spend a lot of time thinking about it. Read other experimental papers, think deeply about the underlying goals of the application, and pilot test the measurement. Refine it until it's getting consistent results on your pilot test. Then do the real study. And that's it. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the very interesting and thoughtful open talk. Uh, so I think we have one question from Shashara in the chat, the more generic question about NLP and HCI. Do you want, do you want me? Yeah, want me I see it. How do, how do we navigate the cultural differences? Yeah, it's hard. Um, people are really interested in the combination now because of this human in the loop, which should be called machine in the loop. So there's a lot of interest now, and there a lot. There's always workshops on it. Uh, there's this year in NACL, it's there's a um, special track on HCI and NLP, and I advised on that track on how to make it more amenable to people doing the work. Personally, I think the papers have to be longer because you can't describe an NLP technique that's innovative and a study fully in the number of pages allowed. Um, but mainly it's a lot of work to be in multiple communities. You have to review different uh, conferences and know different people. And these days it's very hard to stay up on the literature. When I started, it wasn't a problem, but I can't really, I can't do the NLP anymore. And I'm, I'm totally out of IR. I mean, I'm really out of it completely. So it's, although I did review for the IR, you know, IR track for ACL, so I actually got up to date on some stuff uh, this year. So it's a lot of work to be interdisciplinary. <laughs> the real answer is you need to have teams. That's really how research is done today with lots of co-authors so that one person doesn't have to know everything. And then you have to be willing to listen to the other people. I think that's the, that's the practical solution. Great, thanks. Uh, is there any other questions from the audience? We probably have the time for one more question. Okay, great. So uh, it was yeah, Jeremy is saying it was a great talk. Yes, uh, I second that. And again, thanks for accepting our invitation and for giving such a nice talk. Uh, 